So um, I'm John Rose. Welcome. I'm glad to see you all. And I'm going to talk about some particular aspects of how we would like to do, um, like to manage some of the complexities of Panama and Valhalla. And um, you heard previous speakers yesterday, and the f speakers to follow me today will um, say a lot of stuff, and they really know what they're talking about. Um, I'm going to say a lot of stuff, but I don't know what I'm talking about. Instead, what I'm going to do is speculate on where the interesting, um, some of the interesting tactics might be in, in the future as we, um, as we try to find the best way to, uh, as James Gosling said, do the equivalent of an, a large number of PhD theses to get value types and, and similar things done. Um, we, haven't, we haven't gotten all the PhD theses written yet, although I am very impressed on behalf of my colleagues um, how much has been done in the last 12 months since we did our last checkup at the summit. So this is not going to be a talk about what cool stuff we can do today. It's more like how we might uh, contrive to do some of the difficult stuff in the coming year or so. So um, that's what Going Meta is about. And I provided you a um, slide link up there in case you, like I, like to follow the PDF of the speaker um, and dwell on slides when the speaker is hurrying ahead and trying to uh, shovel something underneath the underneath the, uh, the pile of leaves. Uh, this is not some a, a talk that you can take to the bank, but we all knew that anyway. Um, my thesis is meta is the way to do things when um, you don't want to do things the, uh, the hard uh, manual way. Um, we have the privilege of working with software, which means we can make, um, if we're clever, uh, and we all are, we can make a robot to do our dirty work for us at the drop of a hat. And it's so much more fun to make a robot to, do your, to clean your desk than it is to actually clean your desk. So um, if, imagine if, uh, if, a, if, a, if a kid had the ability to make robots as easily as we make software, and the kid was told, go clean your room. What would the kid do? Of course he'd make a robot to clean his room and then watch the robot do it. Uh, and so that's, um, we, we would prefer to have the, the, you know, our software generate our software. And in fact, that's, that's generally true. That's why we have high level languages, compilers, tools, generators of all sorts. So um, meta sounds uh, very pretentious and, and um, uh, above the fray, but it really is the way we do our, our, our daily work. Um, and so I want to point out a couple places where we can go meta even more than we do already uh, in, in solving problems with uh, native interconnect and with value types. Um, I want to tell you one story about meta that's not related to software or cleaning rooms, and that is uh, some of my family members and friends are, were involved in, uh, in speech and debate. Uh, debate is where uh, two teams stand up before a judge and argue some uh, point that's either yes or no, and one team wins and the other team loses, and it's like a tennis match, or, and you know the, the 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 best team wins at the end of the day and gets a trophy. And um, this was at the high school level, so you have some some young bucks who uh, who who think that it's, it's kind of fun to turn over the tables instead of play the game. So what, what, what was very popular during one season in particular was called the critique. And what a critique is, is you're, um, you show up, the other team shows up, the other team has this really uh, nifty plan that's related to this year's debate topic, and they're going to tell you how they're going to change the tax structure of this or that, and it's all very intricate, and they're prepared to, to defend their brilliant idea to the hilt. And the other team comes up and says, OK, it's our job to argue against you and make you lose. But you know what? We would like to call into question the very existence of this, uh, this meeting here. We think it's very unjust, and it's a structural injustice, in fact. And here's the reasons why. And unless, uh, unless we immediately abolish this debate league, then the polar ice caps will melt and we'll all drown. And, and, and so that's, um, that's another example of going meta, when you, when you don't feel up to doing the real job of engaging with the policy details of the other team's um, argument. You can always kick the table over and, and try to win that way. And so uh, going meta is a, is a wonderful way for especially a procrastinating engineer like myself to kick the table over and do something fun instead of the desk cleaning that you, that you should be doing. So let's do something fun. OK. Um, I have a demo, wish me luck. Um, 
let's see if I can get this thing on the screen. There is a, there is a Project Panama, which you've probably heard of, and there, uh, the, the idea of Panama is to make it possible for Java programmers to eventually get um, access to C APIs, eventually C++ APIs, uh, IDLs, any, any, any foreign schema that's not itself already a Java API, and be able to morph that, um, that, foreign, that foreign API, whatever its schema and native language is, into a set of Java APIs that then can be uh, manipulated with the goal of being not too not losing too much in translation. Obviously, a Java programmer is going to program in Java, so he's not going to write hash define for C, but um, it does make sense to say, okay, what are the elements that a C programmer uses when a C programmer approaches uh, the, the use of a library? Well, that would be the header files and the library and maybe some makefile um, parameters, maybe some, uh, some definitions on the C command line, some linkage options. You mix those in, you usually put them in a make file, you make your program and, and, uh, and off you go. We want to take out the C program and put in a Java program and that requires putting in a translation layer between the header file and the other options into Java and that's, that's what JExtract does. JExtract is not unique. Um, it, there, there will be other extractors which work on other um, API schemas besides C but we're starting with ANSI C because it's nice and simple and it's fairly, fairly clear how to, how to work with it. Now, um, during this demo, assuming the demo works, if it doesn't, I'll just show you the slides that I have for backup. Um, things to watch for is that there are some jars that just sort of appear as the output of JExtract, and these jars have um, no human written code in them. It is extracted um, metadata that, ooh, there's that word, that, that, talks about, that talks about the header file and the other um, interesting options that were presented to JExtract. Um, types to watch for. Once we actually load these, um, these jars and start to work with them, uh, we'll see um, a, a type called, a Java type called library, which is a library. Um, and in particular, it embodies those, um, uh, the, the runtime aspects of the, um, that information that was originally in the make file when you were coding C. Now it's gone through JExtract and it gets passed through jar, the jar file and it's, it's now um, uh, used to load a library. Uh, pointer is a pointer, um, uh, but it's a, uh, it's got some bounds checking and some type checking attached to it, so it's a little bit safer to use than, um, than, than a regular C pointer, a little bit safer. Um, and then there's a, a, a thing called a scope, which will show up very briefly, which is um, roughly speaking, a lifetime into which you can dump any number of native resources. Um, uh, you can think of it as a, uh, as a working list of malloc blocks. Um, that's kind of what it is, but it, um, of course, it, being Java and being an interface, it has, it, uh, you know, has, has, has wider uh, um, pretensions. And then there's an operation which puts the, um, the jar file together with, the, um, with, the, with types online and, uh, and binds them to uh, implementations. So watch for bind. Okay, um, first of all, very quickly, uh, this kind of might work for you maybe uh, for building your own Panama. We don't have builds yet of Panama, it's still early days, but I thought I'd put this in for the record. These slides, as you saw, are available online and, and so that you can pull the details out later on. Um, let's see, what can I do here? Uh, oh, I, if I read me, if I look at the readme, I, I find I have to download another artifact. It's not all automagic, um, so I have to download Clang. What's Clang? Clang is, of course, the, uh, the engine behind the C++ and C compilers that, that many of us use. Um, and it knows how to parse C header files, which is what we're going to use it for. So then we make that, and uh, once the making is all done, then there is a, um, a JH stands for Java Home. That's just my, my shorthand for getting to it here in this example. What I'm going to do is um, I'm going to find out that, in fact, I've actually built a, um, an ad hoc version of, of Java 12, and I, I find that there's a new command in there called jextract, so it all looks good, and I'm going to also look at this stuff in the IDE if I want to make sure it's all, it's all good. Um, that open line isn't quite right, but all right, you get the idea. Everyone, every one of us knows how to get into the IDE, but have you noticed that there's a different, different way for each of us? The, um, the scripts sort of don't, aren't fully there yet, but Hopefully we'll figure that out. It's really sad that the OpenJDK um, 
is one of the very few um, major projects in which you code Java where the IDE defaults don't really work very well for you, at least not for me. I haven't figured it out yet. The rest of you have, I'm sure. Okay, let's kick the tires. Um, here is the third, the third command line there is the um, jextract run, which works. And the, the funny little word that sounds like awkward um, are the workarounds, um, which currently are necessary, which shouldn't be. So the, the, uh, the workaround, imagine, imagine that that's not present, but in fact, that's necessary to make things work. Um, this is on Mac, by the way. So there's a, there's a symbol in the header file called zopen. Which, which the bind command is gonna stumble over because the open doesn't happen to, be, happen to be present in the runtime, it's just declared in the header file. You get stuff like that you know, um, in, in header files. So I excluded bind and I, uh, Z open, so bind wouldn't have to look for it and I excluded all the double underscore symbols, um, which you're not supposed to look at anyway because that's part of the C implementation. So there's, there's awkward stuff, but basically what I'm doing there is I'm making myself a jar called standard IO and, um, and it includes the, um, the metadata uh, from standardio.h. And the metadata, what's the metadata? Well, it's the, it's the, the names of all the um, entry points that are declared and all the types and all the structs and type defs and everything in there, even some macros that we, we can wrestle out. Um, all right, and so um, now that we have our standard IO class, one thing I wanna point out about it um, is that it's, um, it's not really much larger than the original header file or header files. Uh, as you can see, the, um, the compressed size of, of um, standard IO class is uh, t about 22K um, on, on disk. And we're, let's, see if, let's see if the uh, window switcher works here and we can s maybe try and find out what's in it. I think I have to get out of presentation mode. Go switch, switch. Okay, and here we are in presentation mode in my favorite IDE. And where, how do I get to the, <laughs> let's see. There's some stuff. Uh, no, this is favorites, I don't want favorites. How do I, how, what's the button for um, getting to uh, the project structure in the files? Oh, here we are. Add it, yeah, great. Tiny font. Okay, so what we're looking at here is um, uh, a, uh, a property file inside of the meta information of the jar, and you'll notice that uh, the jextract uh, options have been faithfully passed through. So somebody's gonna look at that in a second. But more interestingly, let's look at the, um, the types inside there. Let's see, here's, boy, that is small. That is really small. This is where I wanted to get. Okay, so what you're looking at now is the class file of the um, of, of standard io.h uh, somehow morphed into metadata that Java knows how to read. What, what's Java met, metadata? Well, it's uh, it's a class file, and in particular, you'll notice that um, at the top of this, it's a, it's an interface. That's why there are no function bodies here. There's not a single drop of code in this. It's all annotations and signatures and names. So it's, um, it's really meta, right? You haven't gotten to coding yet at all. You've, you've put off the necessary chore of, um, uh, of coding and instead you're having fun uh, uh, reasoning about programs. You haven't descended into the fray yet. Let's see, if there's some, um, where's a function here that we recognize? These are really odd functions that I've never seen before. Um, how about Fopen? Where's, uh, there we go. Um, can everyone see this? Okay, yeah, it's, it's not so bad. Um, so here, here is a interface method called Fopen, uh, which is uh, going to be the um, entry point that I use from Java when I feel like coding in Java, but I want to code against standard io.h. So I'm going to use a Java method called Fopen, but the, Java, the type of this Java method is it's gonna take a pointer to a byte and a pointer to another byte, and return a pointer to a thing called S file, which is a little bit awkward, but uh, that's what we get right now. Um, wow, so that's a nice promise. How is that promise going to be fulfilled? After all, I, I, can, I can build meta robots all day long, but eventually I have to run them and get my work done. So what's, uh, who, who is going to write the code for Fopen? I don't want to write it, that's a robot job. Um, if you look at the native location, um, information above, you'll see that there's some, um, some other in, uh, evocative in, uh, information about Fopen, which is preserved for somebody. 
Um, eventually, somebody is going to look at the type of FOPEN and going to look at the name of FOPEN and say, okay, um, that refers to a, um, uh, an entry point in a C library. I'm going to go dig that out, and I'm going to use some fancy new, um, never, never actually seen and admitted unsafe call to not just peek and poke um, bytes in a struct, but to peek and poke an actual function linkage. So we're going to do, we're going to do function, function linkage in the unsafe style. Uh, there is a piece of information not present here, which is elsewhere in the file. Let's see if I can get back to it. Where's Fopen in the giant? There's a, this really should be line broken. Anyway, in the middle of, a, of a, what's called a layout string, there's some additional metadata, which you can recognize as a function signature right there. And that will tell us um, uh, a lot more about how, uh, how FOPEN is to be called, and in particular, what is the nature of the structure returned from it. So I hope you agree with me that this is very meta, and uh, it's going to uh, eventually, though, get us into real code. Um, in fact, let's, let's see, let's try our luck with that. Um, here I am inside of JShell. Uh, it looks like it already crashed. Um, how about if I exit that and restart? Who knows, okay. Um, uh, as, as you will see, if you look at the slides, I also did a, I, I did a Python import. So it's not just uh, a one-shot thing that only works for standard I.O. I, I can also get to the Python library. Whether or not we can execute the Python library, I don't know. But let's see. Um, uh, let's try a bind. There's a, there's a bind. Oh, yeah, it bound. Okay, so there, this is the function um, libraries.bind. And what did I do? Well, I, I pulled out um, a type called nat.standardio.class, um, which is that interface we were just looking at, which has, for example, a, um, a call uh, FOPEN inside of it. Um, so what can you do with it? Um, do I already have a buff here? Oh, yeah, it's already loaded in my profile. Um, so buff is a, is a uh, pointer to a care. Let's get more information there. Yeah, pointer to byte. And then if I want to say I have a little utility function that will actually turn that back into a Java string, and not surprisingly, it's got zeros in it, so there's nothing there yet. But it, I might want to do um, standard io.sprintf, and maybe I'll get lucky. Let's see. Let's, let's get unlucky first. Uh, anybody see the bug? Of course you do. Oh, there's a bug too. Oh. Uh, this, all right, so this is um, early days. Uh, we have to manually turn our Java strings into pointers. Yes, yes. And it returns five. Um, so that means that's, that the, the, wor the word world went somewhere. Oh, it went into my, my string literal. Yes, of course. Newbie error. So instead, I'll pass in buff. Okay. And now what's in buff? Oh, Glory. Okay, so now um, buff is a is a pointer, so I can do pointer arithmetic on it. Um, let's see, is that? And then I can I can I can paste a byte in there. Uh, okay, and well, the, you get the effect that you expect. So it's it's C programming. You you've um, you've really got C programming in there, and. Um, we think, we think we've got enough uh, tricks up our sleeves with uh, value types and uh, better generics coming down the road and, and even some stuff that's um, been prototyped for the vector API work, which you'll see more about later from Sandhya. Um, we think we can make this actually compile down to code, which is uh, a, not much worse than C code anyway. Um, so it's not like we're having a huge interpretive overhead here. This is optimizable code. Um, but it also is optimizable code where the optimizer is working on bounds checks and type checks. Um, if you want them, they're in there. And so there's, there's more seat belts in this kind of C programming than, than in others. Um, so I, I, I can also bind Python. Let's see. Let's see, Python. Oh, that's so nice. Uh, no, this, I don't have that yet. Python run. So I'm going to run the binder on. Hello, come, 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 bind me. There we go. 
Um, so now I've, I've bound a couple Python header files that I imported earlier on that I didn't show you. Um, and, and now I can, um, if, I can probably run Python stuff, but we'll, let's, let's just see what I've got in my command history here. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, so that's kind of cool. I can run the py initialize function. So now I've got a Python interpreter warmed up inside my, um, my J shell backend. And let's put an at exit. Uh, what you're looking at here is, yes, inverted control flow via C function pointers into, into Java interfaces. That, that, that game works, and um, uh, the VM knows about it, so it's, it's fairly efficient. Okay, and then so if you actually uh, tell Python to exit itself, then it, things will explode, uh, but you should get a, um, a, a, a little valediction on the way out. Yes, okay, so you see at the top of the screen, it did say goodbye, so the callback was run. That's, uh, that's, that's, that's my demo for you. Um, I hope you liked it. It should um, give a flavor of, of the sort of things you can do when you go meta. And so we did, in fact, kick those tires. Um, let's see. Yeah, there's the little buff example. And the Python example. OK. Uh, the diagram is in order. This is, um, this is a diagram from, from Maurizio Cimitamore's uh, discussion about what we're doing right now with Panama, and the, the workflow is we take some uh, native headers uh, and we extract uh, those into a, a native bundle, which was a jar, like standard io.jar or python.jar. Um, and then uh, you can also put regular code in there too, although it's, you know, it's automatic code here and, and handwritten code on the other side. And then you um, you, 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 you pass the, uh, the metadata, which has no bytecode methods in it, um, through the binder, and that, that allows you to um, actually call the functions. Um, yeah. One thing that's important to realize is that there's no JNI in here. There could be. I mean, it could be an implementation technique. I don't want to promise there's no JNI, but um, in fact, there's no need for JNI. It's something, it's an alternate way, it's a meta way to uh, generate the same kind of wrappers that JNI does. And one reason that's good is um, JNI wrappers are handwritten, C-coded chunks of code that, um, that nobody but the original programmer understands what they do exactly. And so you're not gonna optimize through them. But if you have these, uh, these um, VM spun interfaces, then the optimizer does understand them very well, and it can, um, it can inline through them and um, subject to the limitations of what, what it actually finds in the native code. Um, the bytecode was, you saw that the jextract function, the, the, the jextract output, standard io.jar, was rather small. The, um, the, the class file for standard io itself was, uh, um, under 25K. This means that there are no bytecode methods to implement all those zillions of funny little functions, some of which don't exist. Um, instead, it's just the, day, it's just the meta stuff. Um, and therefore, the, the VM, when it loads, um, when it loads the, that file, the file is, in, uh, is incomplete. It only has the declarations, not the, def, not the required definitions. This is one of the um, recurrent themes of going meta is uh, you don't have to do the, f the whole job. You, you, can, you can work on the robot and you don't have to clean your desk yet. Uh, eventually the desk does have to be cleaned and you do have to do something useful. So, but uh, if, you've, if you're clever, then your robot does that, those, those, last, uh, those last operations for you and, and creates your desk cleaning um, engine. And then you watch it and you say, hmm, that, uh, that serves my needs quite well. <laughs> I wrote it in a little language I invented. I named it after um, an obscure island or lake that you wouldn't have heard of. And, and then you can feel very smug. Um, so we start with the, um, we start with the, the, the foreign data. Um, and we pull out the, we pull out the uh, metadata in a form that Java can read. And then later on, you r run a robot binder that creates all of the, uh, all the method bodies for you. And then you get an instance of that header file, which is a, one of these um, single instance patterns. You know, you, you don't have to make two instances of standard I/O. You just need to make one, and then you call, and then you're a Java programmer, and you uh, and you talk to it. So that's the that's the bi the binder pattern, and it's um, it's quite 
quite useful. Uh, it's not just good for, for standard I.O. So the standard uh, advantages of meta apply. You say what you want, not exactly how to get it, and then you let some clever robot get it for you. Um, and also the, 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 meta, the metadata jar um, is perhaps useful for other purposes than just, uh, just binding and executing. The most important thing is that the runtime has the final word on how, how to do it. The, how, how to bind that jar is not something that, um, that some Java C-like program had to generate a zillion byte codes for, or that some JNI engineer had to write a bunch of code for. The binding work is done very late in the same VM that's going sometimes, usually, often, in the same VM that's going to do the calls. And that means that if there's some tr clever hardware instruction like AVX 512 or something that's available for use, then the binder can say, hey, I'm going to use those clever things. Uh, a, a static compiler has to compile to, um, to, to weak assumptions about the, the online platform, and it has to compile conservatively uh, in case not all components are present, but the runtime version of the binder knows what all the components available are, and it can uh, uh, adjust its behavior appropriately. There's another advantage to the runtime binder, which is that the um, runtime binder can be a trusted module in ways that a static compiler cannot. If you, um, it, it, the, as I said, the, the, the tricks that I showed you on the screen there were done with unsafe level um, primitives, which means um, that uh, you have to have some trusted code that runs the unsafe stuff and, and does the bindings and does, writes the peek and poke for the structure elements and so forth. If a static compiler were to do that, then we would be in the position of having to validate or verify the output of the standard, um, of, the, of the static compiler before we ran it, right? That's what a verifier is for. It's to prevent someone from punning a pointer to an, to an int or something like that, breaking the VM. The verification task is much easier on metadata than on executable code. And so that's another advantage. The, uh, you, can, you can pull lots of dangerous tricks in a runtime binder that you can't pull in a static compiler as easily. And it's a general pattern, too. Um, there are some difficulties with it. Uh, in fact, some of them were mentioned yesterday, I thought. Uh, it, it might make things slow to start up, right? Because you, you have to create what the static compiler would have created for you. And wouldn't you like to be able to just map in a bunch of code and immediately execute it? Well, you can't do that in Java anyway, so that's like a sunk cost of, of jitting. So we might as well be even more clever and jit stuff that we've made fresh, uh, fresh just for today. Um, also, the, uh, the startup argument cuts both ways. If I have standard io.h with a thousand entry points in it, do I want to load all thousand bytecode bodies for those things or all thousand C methods for them? Wouldn't I rather run just the metadata and then spin just the methods that I need? So you can be very lazy with an online solution too, and that can actually speed up load times. A uh, big one is you can't debug it, right? What are you going to single step through? That's an interesting one. You, yeah, you sort of have to um, make retroactive uh, stuff that looks kind of hand-coded to single step through. That's a hard problem. Uh, any failure in con configuration is not validated um, as well at, as a static compiler would, perhaps. But of course, it's you know, more accurate information on the other hand. But you, you, know, you can get failures with a runtime binder that, that you might see in a different form with a static compiler, I'll put it that way. So we're, we're still, it's early days, we're still fooling around with this, but it uh, seems to work pretty well. Uh, and one final thing is um, there is a static move that you can do. You can run your binder um, as a compile time constant uh, thingy uh, using, um, I, I, I think it's so wonderful that we're getting into compile time constants in Java. And um, it, it does, uh, someone will be thinking, uh, you know, phased staged evaluation right now. And they'd be thinking, right, the binder is, is like a staged evaluation step that can be done at runtime on the fly, but it can also be done in a, in a linker-like program. So it's, um, it, it's one which has some flexibility in it. It's not just like a bunch of interpreter stubs that you can only use at runtime. Swig. Um, so, more about meta, meta about meta. Um, so you have normal programs, which when you really have to earn your, 
earn your salary, you have to program normal programs, but it's much more fun to program meta programs that program those normal programs for you. So that's kind of what we're looking at. Um, Java has had a certain amount of meta in it from, from day one. It's got the class loader, which is frustratingly um, uh, almost general, and you can almost do good tricks with it, but then you, you find that class loader constraints kill you. Um, but uh, uh, metaprogramming is something that's familiar to Java programmers, especially with the reflection API. Um, the JVM itself is way meta. Um, so what's kind of interesting is what we're doing with Invoke Dynamic and some other bootstrappy things is we're trying to um, uh, tease apart the VM into, into, um, into components that can be used separately. And so um, let's look at bootstrap methods for a second. Where do bootstrap methods live? Somewhere inside the class file structure. Here's a, here is a uh, innocent looking little um, uh, constant pool. And here's some other metadata in your class file. And what can we do with it? Oh, we can, we can have byte codes. There's a code attribute nested inside of a method, nested inside of a class file. You're all familiar with this. We speak byte code here. Um, here's an indie. An indie can refer to the, uh, the constant in the, in the um, constant pool and bootstrap method will give a sort of a meta-assigned meaning to, the, uh, to, the, to that call. It's no longer in your choice of invoke virtual, invoke static, uh, or nothing. It's invoke dynamic, which means all, of, all the behaviors that you could imagine for link time can be um, robotically inserted there. But there's more, there's Condi also. We can, we can have a, um, a patch point in the constant pool itself. Uh, but you know, there's more things that we can do. We talked very briefly yesterday about uh, a possibility of lazy values. So maybe there's some way of linking a, uh, a field um, to a constant pool entry. I'm totally hand waving here. Um, but there's more. Um, wouldn't it be nice if we could uh, generate uh, method bodies on the fly for, for co method code that we don't want to code by hand because we'll get it wrong and because uh, we don't have the full configuration information anyway. I call that MINDY, Method Implementation Dynamic. And of course, there would also be CINDY, which is uh, Class Implementation Dynamic, also known as, what's the, what's the other working title for uh, the um, Class Dynamic? Yes, thank you. Um, so there's, there's a number of places in the class file where we can put these, these meta hooks, these robotic opportunities to plug in new, infor new information on the fly. Um, one of the questions on, on, on how this all hangs together is, um, what is the f what's present in the class file before the robot does its, does its little song and dance? What's, their, what's the recipe that's cooked into the class file that the robot picks up and uses? And that really gets into the question of how you name things, which is fascinating. Uh, the constant pool is really not just, not mainly about constants, it's mainly about names. Names of stuff inside your class file and stuff that you need to get to outside of the class file. So um, can, we, uh, can we hook name resolution? Uh, the answer is yes, that's sort of what invoke dynamic and constant dynamic do. We, we're already inventing name resolution mechanisms. Um, uh, but uh, if you have a, um, Suppose you have a, the, suppose the VM sees a method and sees a marker on it that says, uh, I, don't, I haven't given you a code attribute for today, but just pretend like the code was a single invoke dynamic instruction and do the bootstrap thing for this method. What you have there is a way to very rapidly attach a bunch of um, uh, meta res metadata recipes to, uh, to any number of methods and have them sort of pop into existence as they're, as they're called and linked. Um, and then, of course, classes can do that game, too. And we have some prototypes. And it, it looks promising, right? That's all I'm going to say right now. But I, I, think, it's, I think it's something that we, we, may, um, we may continue putting bootstrap methods in new places. We'll put it that way. Um, so here's how, here's how Mindy might work. And uh, I'll, let you, I'll let you go through the steps yourself. Um, it's, it's kind of obvious. You get a linkage request, you pop up meta, you talk to a bootstrap method, the bootstrap method returns you a, a method handle, then the VM plugs it in so that that's, it's as if that method had had that body all along. Um, and the fun part about it is uh, there's no static versus dynamic conflict. There's only dynamic bugs for what that's worth. Um, we can do this today. As I said, you can pre-generate the method with an invoke dynamic in its body, and we pull that trick sometimes. It's very useful. 
Um, but there's follow-ups we can do. We can, as I said, uh, swap out the code attribute for a method handle attribute, which hasn't been invented yet. Don't go looking for, the, for that in the sources. Another possibility is to inherit specialized methods from a superclass. In other words, the class file doesn't even mention the method. It's up in the superclass, some kind of a combined weird default plus method handle attribute method in the super that gets pulled down and specialized for the subclass. And that's how you do template methods in, uh, for certain purposes. And then f uh, another follow-up to this line of idea, I'm just throwing out ideas here, right, is um, uh, why are super types involved? You know, um, uh, using inheritance to share code is not the best way to share code always, right? Um, when you say import at the top of your Java source code, you are not saying, these are all the super types of my code that I'm about to write. You're just saying, I want to use that method, that method, that type, that type. That's what import is about. And then once you wrap up your class and you give it to somebody else, those, those imports do not bleed through and, and have, have to be dealt with by the, uh, by the user of your, of your object, right? But for some reason, we've got it in our heads that the object-oriented orthodoxy is that all reusable parts must be in superclasses. I, I, I think you know, we, we keep having to reinvent delegation, which is, or importing. So in any case, I think there's some move here involving Mindy where you don't even pull the, you don't necessarily pull method implementations down from your supers, you pull it from some, some other method supplier that you've attached to via metadata with some sort of import-like statement. Uh, the steps are the same for Cindy as for Mindy, um, except there's a problem here. We have method handles for method behaviors. We do not have class handle thingies for, I don't even know what to call them. I, I'm, I'm calling them reflective classes here. Um, so what's a reflected new type? A class is to a method as a what is to a method handle. Good question, huh? I mean, if you're going to do Cindy class dynamic, um, you could just spin bytecodes on the fly, but that's, sort of, that's, that's a disappointing thud. You'd like to elevate into something that has more uh, dy dynamic flexibility in its, um, uh, in, in its programmability than, than just another class. Um, so here's an idea. Uh, the, a class file is a bundle of stuff, constructors, methods, fields, supers, um, some bytecode. Uh, maybe there's a sort of a natural, a method handle-ish version of that, um, that bundle. Um, and so the operations on this bundle would not just be invoke. That's the, a method handle, you just do one thing, you invoke, and you ask it for its type. A class handle, uh, you would say, give me, the, give me your field named X, give me your method named Y. You'd basically do resolution requests against it. Hey, that sounds like you could actually have a hook that goes from the VM's resolution requests up to a method handle and back down. That's very meta. Um, so maybe there's something there. Um, so, but um, the point I want to just assert today is that suppose we have a nice set of, um, of tricks for Mindy, then we can parlay that into a Cindy by just saying that the, that the hooks that you would need to ask for a, a linkage request and find a method in a class and so forth, those hooks can be defined as individual Mindy type um, bootstraps, and then the class as a whole gets a shape that's coherent, if the bootstraps are coherent. Okay, um, there's some other bits that we will need in order to do this right. Um, the VM works super hard to, um, to take, uh, to load classes, create object instances, and implement them efficiently, and with Valhalla, we're working even harder. Um, the VM can also help us with these uh, more fuzzy classes, which I don't know what to call. But this shows how half-baked you know, these thoughts are. I don't even have a good term for it. But in any case, if you have one of these dynamically spun thingies, which may be a class file under the covers or not, uh, you want the VM to help you implement it. And, and so um, I, think there's, I think this goes along with a concept that's been brewing for template classes and, and reified generics in particular, which is the idea of a species. Um, class is a taxonomy unit uh, by which we organize objects. A species is a smaller taxonomy unit, so you have the class, you have, you have all the classes floating around, and then within one class you have species. The idea is that a species um, would be related to a template class as a new type, but not a completely new class. It would be, in a very structured way, derived from the, um, the, the original template class. And in particular, it would be in the same nest. It would share private state. Um, you would have the ability to look at private fields and so forth. 
So it's, um, it's not just make a new class file in the universe that then inherits the protected members of some previous thing. It's really add more, more kinds of types that are projected out of a single class file. So that's the, that's the idea of species. Um, and uh, the best thinking we have so far on, on this is um, you know, a, temp a template class or a, a generic class will have type variables and maybe other kinds of variables in it. Yes, other kinds, Remy. And, um, and you, you can't use a template class fully until you fill in those holes with particular types. So you, it might be a map, but maybe it's a, you can't use the map in, as an instance until you know it's a map of an int to double. And so there's, a, you fill, there's an operation of filling in holes. And that, can, uh, that goes, in my mind at least, that goes along with this um, pattern of using invoke dynamic to fill in dynamically linkable holes inside a constant pool and other parts of the class file. So I think if we think, uh, the, our thinking about bootstrap methods everywhere will also help us think about how to place and fill in holes in templates. That's my hope. Um, and I conjecture that, uh, that we can arrange things so that uh, spinning up species will be fast compared to spinning up whole new classes um, because, uh, because they're tightly coupled together. So you don't like to like, reanalyze the whole, um, the, the whole V table and over, override structure. So I, already, I just described what this slide says. Um, we punch some holes in the constant pool, we mark them with some metadata, and then we fill them in with bootstraps. Um, and the bootstraps would be <coughs> done at a reflective level. In other words, there's no need to say at the VM level, the exact meaning of this template is this expansion process. I don't want to wire that into the virtual metal of the VM. I want to make that expressed as a bootstrap method at the meta level in Java code. And we can do generic methods this way too, um, by having little holes that are just for the method and the holes are filled in for the generic. So um, bootstrap methods are very ad hoc, right? It's just executable metacode. So at some point, at some point your, um, your robot is gonna do something very ad hoc and hopefully he doesn't have bugs in him. Uh, but at least, at, least you can re, re, at least you can reprogram the, the robot by changing his bootstrap method. Uh, you don't have to change the virtual metal of the VM in order to change the behavior of these, uh, of these expansion processes. All right. One, la one final note about, um, about naming. Um, so when you go meta, you can work with live objects that, are, that reflect and mirror your, um, the, the, the program configuration task that you're trying to do. So that's nice, but when you get back again, like I said, to the recipe, that's just dead bytes in a class file. We have to have a, a naming convention. And so that, le that leads us to um, maybe a meta name. I don't know if that's real, but um, the, the things, the, the, the names that invoke the robots, the, the meta, the meta um, bootstrap methods, uh, have to be suitably meta. They can't just be uh, ground level names that the VM ha has the sole interpretation of. So the idea here is, and I think this is a missing piece in, um, we, we've, we've prototyped with this. It, you, you need to be able to expand the descriptor language in a way that doesn't completely break the VM with more complexity, and at the same time lets code generators create the kinds of, of, of recipes and names that they need to, to hand up to bootstrap methods. So um, uh, there's, a, there's a type operator, JEP, which is very drafty. This is all half-baked, okay? So maybe we can have, um, uh, a verifier um, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the linker and the VM linker uh, delegate to a bootstrap method at the right time and otherwise leave the type annotations um, uninterpreted inside the descriptor structure. And this leads you with the idea of a carrier thread, sorry, that was for Loom, a carrier type, which is the type that the VM knows everything about with some annotations on it that says, hey, there's other stuff that somebody needs to know about, just keep this this whole type separate, but you can move it around as an int or a long or a reference or whatever. Uh, examples, you can read those later. Uh, this is a particular syntax, maximally ugly, but then again, it's for the inside of the VM. And so I've showed you some metaprograms in various places, various uses, um, and uh, I think we should continue to go meta.